Hi, this is Tim Pendergrass with Uncut Music Interviews. These are some of the interviews I've done over the years that just kind of sat in a box for 20 to 30 years. I used them for pieces that were promotional pieces. The artist didn't pay for the time or anything. We just put them up on airlines, in-flight programming, on cruise ships, kind of wherever we could just provide five to seven minute nuggets about the music artist. This is one I chased in Vegas because at the time I was trying to do kind of a retrospective of old Vegas entertainers. So I was chasing Tom Jones and Buddy Greco and this gentleman, Engelbert Humperdinck. Uh, my grandfather was a huge fan of Engelbert and that's where I first heard of his music. And you probably all know Release Me and all the other kind of ballads and love songs. And uh, uh, But he was a very jovial guy. This was at the Las Vegas Hilton or whatever it's called now, but where Elvis sold out all his places. And the one cool thing I remember about the interview, we did it beforehand, did a little bit of the sound check. And then uh, they bought us dinner that night, which I thought was very interesting at a really nice steakhouse inside the, the Hilton there. So I was like, wow, we're really royalty here, aren't we? But I talked to him for over a half hour, 40 minutes, and got some great lines about the old days in Vegas and kind of how he got his worldwide fame and career. And so this was in the year 2000. So Engelbert was off this dance album he had just come out with. And then he was just doing a live DVD concert as well, but it wasn't quite finished. So enjoy Engelbert Humperdinck. How's your frame there? Looking good? Yeah. Oh, so sitting that far back, you better talk up a little bit. Guys. It, it, no, okay. Here, I'll lean up a little bit. It doesn't look like the lighting director's here. Certainly for the rehearsal, he'll be here. So we thought we'd just start, and if that happens, you know, uh, yeah. that way we don't take up too much time. Looks real nice. How's that um, shadow on his um, right eye? Well, I can pull that light around just a touch. Sure, it's just putting a shadow there. It looks like you've got a bruise. Curly. Yeah, can you move it? Short delay there. Okay. All right. Again, thank you for coming. My pleasure. <laughs> um, what do you think you're best known for? Well, I guess I'm best known for the ballads that I sing, you know, because it started my life. When I first started, I had all my big smashes around the world were for ballads. And uh, I started off with Release Me and... Am I that easy to forget? There goes my everything. I mean, um, and by the time 1974, uh, uh, we were up to about 100,000, 100, uh, up to about 20, 120 million, 100 million, 100 million. 100 million Albums. records sold? Yeah. Wow. That's tremendous. Yeah. Um, as a singer, who were your big influences when you grow up or decided you wanted to do this? Who do I want to listen to? Or back then, who like what? What well, made you start? Singing? You know, I don't. I didn't have anybody specific that I listened to. You know, because uh, I, I didn't want anything to influence my career. And so, and the way I was going to, and to be an in individual, you know, you get easily influenced with music. You know, wherever you, whatever you listen to. So therefore, you you take on their 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 style. You know, or whatever it is. But I do listen to all kinds of music in order to to learn, you know, and I pick, if, if something is really good, I'll pick a little piece out of that, you know, especially when I'm watching performers like that. Uh, and if that's good, uh, I might steal a little bit. I used to steal um, a lot from uh, watching people like uh, Elvis and, um, and Sammy and, you know, these people. Uh, I think if you're going to steal something from somebody, you got to steal from the best. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure people have stolen from you. Yeah, well, I, I certainly yeah. hope so. <laughs> Um, how, the, how I was reading your bio how your name came about because everybody I think wonders is that his real name but how did your name come about well my name came about with uh, not getting anywhere I mean I tried for years you know trying to get off the ground and you just couldn't do it and I had uh, my stage name was, was uh, Jerry Dorsey but my real name is Arnold George Dorsey so I uh, my manager at that particular time in uh, 1965 uh, was Gordon Mills, and he also managed uh, Tom Jones, you know. Um, and so he thought about this name, this unusual name, this crazy name like Engelbert Humperdinck, a huge name like that, you know. And he, when he first told me, I fell off the stool laughing. I mean, it was just funny to me because it's very difficult to pronounce. And a lot of people at the beginning of my career found it difficult to pr pronounce. But after a while, you know, people made fun of it, called me Pumpernickel, this and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. 
but I didn't mind as long as they were making a sound in reference to my name. Uh, it was Gordon Mills. He he gave me the uh, put the, gave me the name, you know, and of course it worked. It went round the world, and people got to know who Engelbert Humperdinck was. The only place I can't use Humperdinck is in Germany. You see, I can't use it in Germany or Austria because of the composer. Because of the yeah, because of his relatives. And when I first brought it out, there was. Um, a little bit of a problem. They they complained and they they didn't want me to use the name. But uh, the rest of the world knew me as Engelbert Humperdinck. But I just well, is Engelbert in Germany. Okay, doesn't matter. You know. Madonna, Engelbert, Cher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in your bio, it also says you do impressions. I mean, you do them in part of your act or no? When I was very when I was very young, I'm starting. I did impressions because uh, I didn't have any hit records. And in order to get work in little clubs and things like that around the country, I had to do something different. So I thought, well, I can't dance. You know, I can now, but I couldn't then. Um, and I can't play an instrument. I, not very well. I started off on an instrument on the sax, but I wasn't very good at it. So I thought I'd do something that I was good at. And being a, a vocal mechanic, you know, I, I could um, change my voice to different sort of sounds. Uh, so I started doing these impressions in order to get work in the early years. I'm Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, Sammy, and you know I did Elvis too later on. Uh, but uh, that was the only reason why I started the impressions. And sometimes in my show, I will keep it in just to sh show. The, I go back in time and show the people how I began, and that's why I do that. And it's about five minutes. Okay, great. Uh, who do you think your typical fan is? What's my typical fan? Yeah, your typical someone who, who buys your records and comes to your shows. I mean, are they all over the board, age group? Are they mostly women? Yeah, they're, it, I think it's all over the board. You know, it's, a, it's a, uh, from all ages. I mean, I've got fans that, that are tiny tots, you know, uh, all the way up to you name the age. But I think, I think it's important to have across the board uh, fans because it gives you the longevity, you know, and... And uh, the, uh, it goes from the mother to the daughter, and you know, and, and then to their daughter, perhaps, indeed, you know, because I have been in the business now 33 years, and uh, three decades is a long time to be in a business. And mm -hmm. I think you, if you don't pick up new fans, then I think you lost something along the way, you know. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I guess I, I record all kinds of music, you know, in, in order to, uh, it, I, you know, I'm like a ship on the ocean picking up passengers, and that's what I want to do. Great. Uh, to be honest with you, my grandfather uh, loved Man Without Love. Yeah. And got me into that when I was 17. I remember he had this 45 that had like three songs on one side. I see, yeah. A EPs. compilation type of thing, yeah. And yeah. He had, it was the last waltz, Man Without Love. And I remember all my friends going, What are you listening to this for? Next is going to be Andy <laughs> Williams, you know? And I'm like, Listen to this. Yeah. And as soon as they, you know, were able to get into it, it's like, Wow, that guy's got a great voice. Yeah. So I always remember that every time I hear that song now, I think of my grandfather. You know, it's kind of cool. Let me thank you, Grandfather, personally. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, after all these years, why do you keep performing? Um, it's a good question. It's because I love what I do. Uh, I just love it. I mean, it, to this day, it's like walking on stage for the first time every time I walk on stage. The only, the only difference is the fact that I now have people who have seen me many times before, and they are followers and, uh, and staunch, you know, fans. And they come back, and I really appreciate that, you know, because uh, return uh, people who come back and see you time and time again, they know what you do. And if you watch my show, you'll see, you'll know that these people, all these people have been in to see my show before, you know, so they are very, very staunch followers. And uh, some of the female fans are very militant, if you say anything derogative about me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do you ever get to... Stuff thrown on stage from the women. Yeah, yeah, it's it still it still comes on, you know, now and again. It, to some places they they'll throw the, the the panties and things like that on stage. And I could open a shop with the amount of panties I've got. It's ready to go. Personal fitting would be appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, uh, do you ever get tired of singing like the old class? No, I don't. And I, I I tell you what, I still do them. I still do quite a number of my major hits in the show. Um, I think it's important that people remember me by it, and if I don't do it, uh, uh, I will get complaints, you know. So I, I, I do a lot of my, my major, major smashes around the world in the show. And I enjoy doing it. It brings back great memories. 
and uh, they enjoy listening to it, so therefore, why not, you know? I, I also give them a lot of new stuff, contemporary new music that I've recorded, and uh, the change is, is a blessing, really, you know? But uh, I, I, like, I like singing my old song. Every time I hear the introduction of Release Me, I get that, you know, my hair stands up on my hands and my neck, you know, and, and it's like the memories come back, you know, it just comes back and right from the beginning when I was so nervous to walk on stage. And to this day, I still have nerves before I walk on stage, but uh, the confidence of, of knowing that you have been in the business a while and the people know your music and you come out on stage and, and you do what they like, and it's appreciated. Applause is the food of an artist, you know, and I always tell them, thank you for not starving me. And uh, uh, it, it's just wonderful. It's, I love stage. I love the stage. Live stage is my favorite, favorite place to be. When, you, when it comes to do, getting songs for like a new album, the, the new one you have coming out, where do you find songs? You don't, do you write yourself? Or? No. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I, I have written a few songs uh, on some of my albums, but I prefer... Uh, to have other people uh, that have written the songs. Then it's like reading a script for a movie, you know, you can throw yourself into the part and uh, give vent to your emotions and your feelings, you know, and, and uh, without knowing that it came out of your brain, you know? Uh, it's like, and I think it's, you know, some people enjoy doing their own music, but I, do, I like to sing other people's stuff, you know, it's a challenge to interpret it in your fashion, your, your, your style, and, and uh, it's a great challenge. I like other people's work. Let me just change the frame just a little. Could we talk about your new album that's coming out in September? I don't know a lot about it, because uh, 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 Allison didn't give me some info, but this will be airing on the airlines probably about September 1st through the rest of the year. Uh -huh. So you can talk about, like, I have a new album coming out. Or okay. Well, I do. I have a new album coming out. I really don't know what the title of it is as of yet, because... The album that's in Europe right now, which is top 10 around Europe, is, uh, it's, a, it's a real big smash for me, and I'm really excited about it. And you know, I really am excited because, you know, no matter how many gold and platinum albums you have, it's always nice to have another one hanging on the wall. And it gives you a chance to, to breathe and put new, new material out on stage, you know. Uh, this, this one in England is called Engelbert at his best, you know. But when it comes to America, we... What Universal, the record company, did, they put all the new tracks on the front and they put a lot of my big hits at the back because for, uh, I think it was a very, very thought out reason, you know, because most of the, a lot of the younger people who haven't heard of Engelbert Humperdinck, you know, will listen to the contemporary music at the beginning and then as it goes into the end, if they oh gosh, yeah, I, I think I remember that, you know, it rings a bell. And it was a very, very, uh, uh, great thought on the on the part of Universal to, to do it in that respect and uh, you know it was a hit but when it comes here we're taking all the standards off and putting on brand new music you know brand new songs that are written by very very fine and very uh, big writers you know I've got uh, a guy John Reed who wrote uh, Cher's hit and uh, he wrote uh, uh, Enrique Iglesias I yeah. think uh, you know Mm -hmm. Did he write that? Uh, and um, and he, which, which was the other one he wrote? Pardon me? Tina Turner and Rod Stewart. Oh, yeah, the Tina Turner and Rod Stewart hits. They're right now, you know, happening. Uh, he did that, and he's written, he wrote my single, How to Win Your Love. And uh, I've, got a, I've got three songs of his on my, my album, but he's a fantastic writer. Of course, the, you know, it's, it's a combination of, of writer and producer and uh there are three very good producers on there. Brian Rawling, uh, Nigel Lois, and um, Graham Stack. Very, very, you know, big, big uh, managers and uh, big uh, producers in England and the UK. Okay. And uh, on all over the world, in fact, you know. Uh, so I've got them on there, which is an asset. It really is, because they've got a great name and they put out great stuff. Great. Um can you tell me a little bit about the dance album? Because I actually bought that when that came out. I thought that was such a great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just so cool to hear Quando, Quando, Quando with that yeah. kind of salsa beat. Actually, it was my son Scott who is part of man the is manager now, you know, and uh, and uh, he brought these two 
producers to me and introduced me to them and they they're the guys with thunder push 2000 you know they mix like uh good mixes and uh good producers and they came up with the idea of doing some of my standards in dance mode uh i wasn't quite sure about it at the beginning i really wasn't you know but they came to my home in la and they'd already made out the tracks which is kind of clever you know they made the tracks up and they said this is what it's going to sound like and all you have to do is put your voice on it boom sounded great so we did it and it was a top 20 album you know oh yeah well, i think it was great do you do any of that in your live act yes i do direction? yeah mm -hmm. i do yeah. the the quanta version yeah oh do you yeah oh, great everybody gets up and dances <laughs> yeah never happened before in my <laughs> stage performance you know people are now dancing to my music and it's great to have the you know the younger people and everything uh, buying my records and dancing and 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 you know what it's not just the younger people it's it's all ages that are up on that and, and dancing over there uh, and it's nice to see it's nice to see people enjoying themselves during my performance you know must be what it's all about yeah um, uh, kind of an odd question but what's it like being famous or being recognized uh, I guess that's what uh, people go out to do when they first uh, you know first become a a recording star or, or a stage performer you, if you're not a recognized person then you know you might as well not be in the business but I can't understand what happens today. They all wear the dark glasses and everything like that. You don't know who they are underneath those glasses anyway. You know, if they're in the street, they take the glass off. Oh, you don't know. You see, because the eyes are the, the windows of your soul, and, the, it, and those are the expressive parts. The reason why I'm wearing glasses today because I got up late, and I might have a little things under my eyes. <laughs> That's called covering the multitude of sin. <laughs> but uh, uh, I... I well, let's repeat the question because I just got um, lost in it. Actually, what were we talking about? I was, I was now I just look at my next question and I lost my spot. Oh. Oh, was, what's it like to be famous? Or yeah, just I mean, you go to or to be recognized at a table and all that, or no, to be recognized is is quite an accolade actually. You know, to be a person recognized around the world, not only you, but your music around the world, and uh, it's happened to me, and I'm I think I'm very fortunate. I think I'm very fortunate, and. When I first started in the business, I had an image that was, you know, immediately recognized. I had the long sideburns, you know, and uh, it, it just was recognized throughout the world and everybody grew, changed. I was the first one to bring it to the United States, actually, the long sideburns, and then everybody picked on it and I got lost in the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Over your career, is there one single proudest achievement or something that stands out that says, boy, if I had to be over now, I'm glad I did this. Anything that stands out? No, no. I think uh, I think every stage performance is uh, is has equal amount of my life and and time and effort. Uh, I don't think I could I could specifically put it into a a special moment in my life now uh, or a particular place. No. Okay, fair enough. And uh, one last question, and we'll move on a couple of Vegas questions. Uh, over the years, has there been any weird kind of pairings or have you opened for somebody or someone opened for you and now looking back at it, it seems kind of never believed that would happen or play a private party or something? Yeah. Yes, some, some very famous people have opened for me. Uh, well, done the first part of the show, you know, uh, especially uh, people like Jimi Hendrix when he came to Europe, you know. Jimi came to Europe and they wanted to put him with a well-known artist in order to establish him around Europe. And of course, they, they put him with me, and he was my opening. He did the first part of the show. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And one day, my guitarist didn't show up or something like that. I said, what am I going to do? He said, so Jimmy said, don't worry, man, I'll play for you. Now, that was something. That, that, that'll always stay in my mind and in my heart, you know, because this guy was a, a true great man, not only a great musician, but a great person, you know. And then there was the, uh, the Carpenters. They opened for me, you know. Jenny Jones, <laughs> I could go on, you know, because yeah. she was doing a comedy stand-up at the time, and uh, uh, there's quite a few, quite a few. Oh, that's pretty funny. Um, now on to some Vegas questions. Actually, there's one last one that I always get a funny, sometimes get a good answer out of. Have you ever gone into a karaoke bar as a joker to freak people out? Yes, I have. I was, in, I, I was in Hawaii in a karaoke, a karaoke bar, and I was going to have a Chinese meal, and you have to pass through this karaoke bar to go to, into the Chinese restaurant. 
So I was walking through and there was a guy sitting at the bar singing, So I sing you to sleep after the loving. Uh, you know, it was um, an oriental person, obviously, you know, but uh, uh, Asian. Uh, and uh, I thought, I'm going to stand behind him and, and let him finish the song. So he was into it. He was looking at the monitor, looking at the screen and, you know, paying attention to the song. And when he finished, I tapped him on the show and I said, very good. He went, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite amusing. So, but you haven't got up and actually sang or sang someone else's song um, to see no, if they recognize you. I have, I have sang, in, you know, like uh, I was in Hong Kong and, and uh, after the show, we went to the, a, a restaurant and they had karaoke machines in the restaurant over there, in the Japanese restaurant. So uh, they had this machine and I sang for two hours in a private room, obviously. So they opened the slide doors and everybody was standing over there watching me, <laughs> watching and listening to me sing, you know, which is, um, I don't do very often, you know. I, I must have had a couple of sakes that night. <laughs> Our, uh, uh, just to quickly, Justin Hayward of Moody Blues, he's the lead singer. Yeah. I asked him that question. In France, I guess he got in and some guy didn't recognize him. And he goes, uh, I want to do Nights in White Satin you know, the biggest Moody Blues yeah. song. And the guy goes, great, I'll do Funny Valentine if you do Nice and White Satin. So the guy, the guy got a bigger applause than Justin did. Did he? And he kind of went, yeah. <laughs> but it was actually <laughs> pretty funny the way he told the story. I, I always loved that. All right, in uh, Vegas. Uh, do you remember the first time you ever played in Vegas? Yes. Uh, it was in uh, 1968. My very first visit here, I was at the Riviera Hotel. And um, the, I was standing by the window, looking out of the window, and it was, I don't know, about one o'clock in the morning. I was still nervous about the next day, you know, and I saw the big marquee, and I saw them putting my name up in lights. Well, the, everything started to <laughs> rumble in my head. Butterflies like you won't believe. I think they must have been coming out of my ears as well. Uh, but it, there was a lot of butterflies happening in me, and when I finally saw the entire thing finished, it was the greatest thrill of my life to say, I'm in Las Vegas, and my name's on the marquee. A little lad from Leicester, <laughs> England. <laughs> you know, and it was quite, quite, uh, quite something. It'll always stay in my mind then. What was Vegas like at that time? Were there a lot of per other performers? Were there people you wanted to go see? Wow, I can't believe Sammy is playing here. And yeah, well, kind of thing, or? you know, when you think back 30 years ago, all the great performers were around, you know, and, uh, and working. And... Uh, and it was nice to be able to go and see other performers play, you know, because I, I used to come in a day earlier so I could catch two shows, three in fact, I'd go to a lounge show as well, you know. So uh, I, I would catch who, whomever is uh, the big name in town, you know, I would go and catch the show and uh, then go see the lounge show. But when I finished my two shows and I, we used to come in for a month, do 56 shows in a row, you know, and then have a day up and go to maybe Tahoe, do another 28 shows in a row, you know. And uh, it was hard work, but it was a very enjoyable, and it was different. I mean, to, Vegas today has, has grown to an extent that you, uh, you, no one can perceive, you know. It's just a, a jungle of hotels. Done very well, you know, it's done very well. Uh, but I think back in those days, it was exciting because it was still desert, you know. You, did, you, you felt as if you were still in the desert. And then most performers would suffer with a thing called Vegas throat. Do you know what Vegas throat is? Just too dry or? No, it's being up all night, okay. <laughs> and not going to bed till five or six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. That's what Vegas throat <laughs> oh, is. Oh, okay, we've been missing. Uh, lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. Because you see, when we finished our show, we'd go to a lounge show and see a lounge, a lounge show. And don't, you don't get out of there till three o'clock in the morning, you know. And then we go to breakfast. You know, and when wait for the sun to rise, then go to bed. Good so days. Stay still around for you, or you don't do that anymore? I don't do that, no, because the, the lounge shows are not around anymore. Yeah, they don't go that late no. anymore like that. Um, did other performers uh, early on that time, or even today, did they come see you? Oh, yeah. A lot of performers have been to see me, uh, and I, I will bring up the fact that uh, Elvis did come see me, you know, and uh, when he came, um, they told me he was in, and, and the, the lights went out, and then he walked in after the lights, you know, and uh, sat down. Then I, when I introduced him, he stood up on, the, on the, um, the booth seat, and he opened his cape, 
and the audience was absolutely berserk, you know. And it took me about 10 minutes to quieten them down until I said, hey, Elvis, it's my show. <laughs> so I had to bring out one of my big guns, you know, to uh, sing next and go to quiet the audience down. And I, I did, and I finally quietened them down. But when he came back, you know, it was just magnificent to meet this man, you know. Uh, I'll never forget it. Is there any, uh, speaking of Elvis, particularly, I know he played here for like eight straight years. I know, yeah. Sold out every show or something. Yeah. There's a big plaque out front. Uh, I mean, were you friends with him and hung out? Yeah. Did you go well, see we his show? I always saw his show and I go backstage and have a chat with him and if one thing and another. Um, I think it was in the, uh, during the Elvis uh, era over here, uh, I was playing here at that particular time with him too, you know, and uh, I think we were, there were three people that sold this place out and that was Elvis, myself and... Uh, I think, believe it was Bill Cosby, and uh, it was quite exciting to be in the same room as uh, the man I admired. You know. Oh yeah, All inspiring. I'm sure. Were any of the the Sammy or Frank or those guys around the, the time that you were spending? Yeah, oh time yes, here? oh yes, they were around. Uh, I, Frank never came to see my show, but uh, I, I I saw his and I went back and say hello and everything. You know the usual things, uh, and it was a pleasure to meet him and. You know, know the know the man. Uh, uh, Dean Dean was one of my favorites. You know, uh, I'll always I'll always have good memories for him. I used to have dinner with him a lot of nights in L.A. You know, at the restaurant over there. He was a character, and I have I, I loved him. People like Cary Grant, people you know, all the big names who walk into the show. It's. Um, I don't think it happens so much in today's world, you know, for the simple reason they probably got other things to do, but, it, but before it seemed to be more prevalent in the way of uh, showbiz. Every, every show business person would pay homage to another home, uh, another showbiz, you know, they'd come in and see a show and pay homage, you know, and I think, I think that was wonderful. I wish it still existed. I believe that uh, it's going to exist tomorrow because um, uh, one of the legendary figures of Las Vegas is coming to see me, Wayne Newton, you know? And I went, I go see his show and he, he's coming in to see mine tomorrow. Oh, great. We're actually gonna, we got permission to interview him in two weeks. Oh, so we're good. We're coming back. We tried to get him during this leg, but his schedule didn't permit. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, definitely have to talk to him. I've seen interviews with him. He has great, oh, he's, he's, great old stories. He's, he's, old he's, great. he's been here a long time. He's a legend in this place, you know? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, Tom Jones, there's always been like a comparison or a rivalry, you know? No, Jones, there's but... no rivalry involved. We were partners at one time, and uh, his music is totally different to mine. And um, I, he's got a great voice. I mean, just that's one of the reasons why he's still around today. And he loves to work, too. He's traipsing all over the world, too, you know, and, and uh, enjoying it. And that's what I like to do. I'm, I'm all over the place, you know. My, uh, half my life is spent in the air flying to different countries which I dearly love. And imagine you, you go to a foreign country and you're singing your songs and the people that don't speak your language are singing along with you. That's what karaoke did, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's great. We still okay time-wise? We still all right? A couple more questions? Or hmm? We still okay with a couple more questions? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you think you've had any influence on any of today's artists or have people come up to you and said, you know, because of you, I'm in the business or anything like that. Oh, yeah. That's happened. And I, I mean, uh, I suppose they do to me like I've done it to other people, you know. And, I've, and it's, it's a cycle, which is a wonderful cycle, you know, to know that you've inspired somebody else into the business. You've inspired them in a certain way, in a creative form, you know. Um, I've, I've been inspired by other people, and I'm sure people have... I, I, Appreciate the fact that they've chosen me to say that, to do that. Well, you have a great voice. I think Thank anybody you. who really enjoys vocal, you know, you're one of the top ones up there. Thank you. Um, um, Vegas. Um, when do you think it became uh, where Vegas took a turn and became, it used to be all the night uh, lounge singer type, you know, the Frankie and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden now it's today's rock bands play here where it didn't seem like in... 70s or 80s, that was a hip thing to do or something. you have any idea why that changed over? No, I think I just it's a matter of time, you know, that uh, you have to change with the times. And the, the time came to make the change. And uh, 
they did it. I don't know whether it was the best change, but, you know, taking out lounges and because people got their apprenticeship from being in the lounge, you know, and uh, if you, you've got to spend time working and creating an, a, an act and, and becoming used to the stage and, be, and being, being able to play to tougher audiences than the, my audiences, you know, because these people have just come there to have a drink and be entertained and, and it's like entertain me time, you know, entertain me. <laughs> Show yeah. me this. Huh? Come on, prove it to me. Yeah, prove it to me. Let's we'll see you hit those notes again. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a shame. It's really a shame. Yeah, kind of the old Vegas of old is. Why uh, is Vegas a really the, like the best audience you could get, or not necessarily? I mean, what is it about Vegas that performers stay here a lot? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, try to find out which is the best audience and with things like that. I think it's up to the performer how good your audience is, you know, no matter where you go, it doesn't matter. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of, of Vegas, it was kind of tough, you know, because there were so many major artists on the strip, you know. But now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's thinned out a little bit. And when a major artist walks in, they practically dominates the, uh, the strip a little bit, you know. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. And then uh, one last thing is, uh, I don't know that, that you already answered. Uh, were you in England in the late '60s, or did you come to America right away? No, no, I was. I was in England. Uh, released I me was what, like '66, '67? It was in '67, and it was number one in, I believe, in nine or ten countries around the world. And it was my largest selling album, and it established me right at the beginning of my life. And it was wonderful, you know, Just to know up. that that one song can can send you around the world. That's a perfect close right there. Thank you.